puppeteer. And I've been a professional puppeteer for 13 years. This is what I do for a living. And I see a lot of faces going. <laughs> I get that a lot, don't worry. It's absolutely cool. Uh, have any of you ever seen a puppet show? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, how many of you saw Rajasthani puppet shows? I knew it. Great. And how many of you saw something else? Gita, you're not allowed. Um, okay, now I'm interested in something else. How much of this was television puppet theater? Wow. So there was something apart from television puppetry and Rajasthani Katpuklis that you've seen. This is wonderfully hard to do. Because this morning we talked about beliefs. And I'm here to challenge one of the major beliefs about puppet theater. That puppet theater is this, and it's for little children, and it's non-serious, and it's silly. Uh, because for the last 13 years, this is what my life's mission has been, is to convince adults to come and watch puppet theater. And let me explain a little bit. We are essentially a group. You must be wondering who the men in black are. Uh, they are not alien slayers. They are puppeteers, and this is our team. Uh, one of the most exciting parts of being a puppeteer is that you get to be a team, and we're really a family. We practically live together. So, Avinash, Shimi, and uh, and there are two others, and together we are the Katikatha Puppet Arts Trust. When I was nine years old, I fell in love with puppet theatre. I didn't know it yet, but I did. I saw my first puppet, I started playing for fun, and for a long time, it became this little hobby. You got invited to birthday parties, got a lot of TVs, so I did it for fun. But when I was 20, as a lot of you might be and were, I had to choose a career. And I never thought puppet theater was going to be a career. But one night, I really had to decide, because I, it was either film school, social anthropology, or none of the above. And the third option was just staring me in the face, literally slapping me, and I decided to be a puppeteer. That was the easy part. Then started the really hard part. There are no puppet theater training courses, schools, foundation setups in India. They don't exist. There are traditional puppeteers who are doing this for generations, and there are 18 living traditions, Rajasthani Katputlis being one. There are shadow puppets, which are projected puppets. One of the world's largest shadow puppets is from India. It's three and a half thousand years old. It's called Tolu Bombalatam and it comes from Andhra Pradesh. We have many other string forms apart from the Rajasthani Katputis. In fact, the Katputis are the youngest puppet form. They are only 400 years old. So you can imagine how old this form is. Unfortunately, my parents are not puppeteers. And I always regret it. I wish they were. But um, they're very supportive, so that's lucky for me. Uh, when you don't belong to a traditional family, where do you go? At the moment, as I stand and speak here, there are 12 repertory puppet theatre companies in India, out of which only three do this full time. I'm lucky to say we are one of the three in this huge, gigantic population. But it's not been an easy road. And like I said, after choosing, first was where do you train? Nowhere. So you learn by trial and error, mostly error, <laughs> and severe trial, and you goof around a bit. I was very lucky in 1997 to suddenly go to the heart like a lot of us do, to suddenly see this spectacular public performance by a Swedish group called the Marionette Theatre. I completely fell in love with their work. It was incredible. I wrote to the director six months later, I heard from them and they said, okay, you can come and be an intern for a year. So I interned with them for one year and that was the beginning of my understanding that our theatre was so much more than what everybody believes it is. One of the most exciting things of that was it really changed my life 360 degrees. A, I became a traveler because puppet theatre takes you everywhere. You're like a circus. One day you live in a tent, the next day you live in a five-star hotel. Depends on who your host is. Uh, you meet the most incredible people in the world. You meet very eccentric puppeteers. You meet the man on the street. We've worked in prisons. Now we are currently working in Riman homes in Delhi. 
We are working with young people under 18 who are in prison. We work, uh, we post tsunami after six months when everything was built, we went to tsunami hit villages to work with people's morales. Uh, communities who had lost their livelihood. They were bored, they were getting dual. Men had turned to alcohol, the women had nothing to do. And they said, do something. They found us online, we went there, lived there for 15 days, and we made puppets with them. But it's incredible, it turned into a traveling puppet theater company of Fisher women. We worked seven months in Kashmir collecting stories of just women. Not the men who are at war, but the women who stay at home. And the power of the puppet is that it has no ego. It is no body, it is nothing. It is paper, it is fabric, and the adult who watches it knows this. Yet, you believe, it laughed, it cried, it moved, you laugh at it, you get stunned by it. Why did this happen? Any ideas? Yeah, but you imagine the emotion. It doesn't really have emotion. It's made of paper. Paper doesn't have any emotion, ever. It's because you invest your imagination in it. You believe this. And it's only possible the puppeteer is making a few suggestions. I should turn that into a phone puppet. <laughs> we do that sometimes. Phone puppets are great. They respond to each other, also have a language. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much because I think it's necessary to show you what we do. And one of the things they've been doing is we are trying to evolve the technique which is ours. Because unfortunately I don't belong to a traditional system. So where, who am I? That is the question. What is my puppet here? And I'm going to show you the basic building blocks. Before that, let me tell you about four forms of puppet theatre. The classifications are based on the manipulation technique. How you move the inanimate object. Glove puppets, you must have seen this as school kids. Glove puppets. street puppets. Rod puppets, you have little sticks all over the body of the puppet, you move them. And shadow puppets. When the lights go off, they go off quite a bit in the you have a candle, you're young, what do you do? Play crazy game with your brother or sister, huh? Where you make things on the wall. Shadow puppetry, that's your first shadow puppet show, mind you. Value it. Um, so what I'm going to show you is the technique that we use. This is a complex rod puppet technique. Those at the back might not be able to see it, you might have to stand up. It's a complex rod puppet because not one, but three people move it. It's inspired by a Japanese technique called Bunraku. Bunraku is a 16th century technique from a, a place outside Osaka. Just to tell you, give you a context, in India, puppet theatre, classical arts, Japan, puppet theatre, everything else, the highest form of performance is puppet theatre. Uh, the master puppeteer is known as the national living treasure. I should have been born into that. Anyway, that's an aside of the record. Um, here's something which is inspired by that. This is not Bunraku. What you will see is the reason why there are three puppeteers is you can articulate every part of the puppet exactly like the human body. And I must add a note, a puppet doesn't have to be a human form. It can be something very abstract. You have the head, which moves exactly like the human head, the neck joint, the waist joint, the arms, the ball and socket joint at the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist. You have thigh, where you lift the leg to walk, jump, the knees, and the ankle. It's exactly anatomically like a human being, but it isn't. Okay, when we do movement, we study our own bodies, which is why all of us have had to study anatomy and then mind. These were very important parts of our training. When we simulate movement, for example, a very simple movement, we take this for granted, sitting down. <coughs> Try it with the puppet, it's really hard. And you get to know how much effort our human bodies need. Lying down, 
These are two of the simple movements in the puppet. Now to stand up. And now we're going to do a slightly more complex movement. This is the walk. The walk is the hardest part. If you can master the walk as three people, you're good puppeteers. The day they have a fight, this is what the puppet looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so coordination is absolutely essential. And you really have to know what the other people, the other person is thinking. And they improvise all the time. Um, this is what a human being can do, so it's believable for you. Now let's do something which a puppet can do but a human can never do. Let's fly. Or maybe we should walk imaginary stairs first. Imaginary stairs. And now that he's reached the top, maybe he should dive. Oh, he didn't do that. And he can swim in the air. Can any, any of you do that? <laughs> That's why we are puppeteers. We're living all our dreams. <laughs> Your flight is right here. Now, the second part, which for me is the most interesting part. For us, it's something which we've been working on for years, is the relationship we have with the inanimate. Because that is the most essential thing. We don't cover ourselves. We don't wear boots. We do wear black. It's a backdrop for our puppet. But we never try to detach ourselves or pretend we don't exist. We exist and we have a very special relationship. And that is breath. So the first thing we have to do is transfer our breath onto the puppet. And this is how it's done. We're going to do the lying down position. And Pawan's going to do how the puppet breathes. We don't do this in every show, but we just believe this in our head. Because if you believe it breathes, you will believe it lives. Okay. Thank you. He's a bit tired. I think we should rest now. Thank you. Show, <laughs> and this is where we've tried to push the technique a little further. When we adapted this technique from the Japanese bunraku style, which is 400 years old, and a lot of puppeteers across the world use it, we were still trying to find out what is it that we could give to it as an Indian puppet theatre company. What we found is that the Bunraku technique has a very special grammar. A, they perform on a table. Uh, the master puppeteer has to train for 36 years. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. Uh, we had to do this much faster. Uh, what we had to look for is a grammar for movement. What is the grammar that our puppet could use? And you realize some of the things the puppet can't do is move its face because it doesn't have facial expressions. It can do very limited uh, face changes. You imagine it is sad because it does this. I do this, I look ridiculous. You know, but the puppet does it, you're like, oh, you must be sad. So these are the uh, sort of very basic grammar we had evolved. But then we had to think of where do we get the ideas for movement. I'm going to show you a little demonstration. This is from our Ramayana. Our Ramayana is from the Kirti Vas and Bhakti version of the Ramayana. It uses animation and puppets. The animation segment is not uh, something we're showcasing today, but the puppet is something we'll show you. The reason why I picked this piece is here, a human will transform into a monkey. Our Ram takes on the persona of Hanuman. You will see how the body language changes. And to study this, we have to really study monkey movement. But also how monkey movements are represented in dance. Okay, so this is Hanuman from our performance about Ram.
but it's almost the same. But what is most important is to keep the same center of gravity, to keep the same intention, and the same force. Uh, we're going to show you the war piece from our play about Trump, but this time using a puppet, doing the same movement that the dance. Thank you.